black blade cut his head from his shoulders. As the sink shaft descended into screaming chaos, Tei Kaurangi watched Cedric. The boy alone didn't react as those around him were snatched and subdued by the silent giants. He didn't react as his shrieking grandmother was picked up as easily as a parent might lift a child and taken towards the waiting flyers. He didn't react as the skies filled with fat-bellied shuttle sows that would take the population of Zartak to the White Maw's slave bays. He watched it all with dull, dead eyes. Te Kahurangi touched upon his mind and knew that the boy had already begun his first steps towards initiation. If he survived, he would bear an honor name, a rarity among the Karkaradons, Astra. It was ironic, he thought, as he looked up at the ceiling and all its shattered grandeur. Ironic that the Karkaradons disdained the modern imperial cult and all its lavishness. Yet, here they stood, bloodied and wounded, having slaughtered thousands in its defense. Holding a place like this meant nothing to the chapter. If you've been following our inconsistent coverage of the 40k universe, you likely know of my obsessive love for the Raven Guard and their various successor chapters. There is no more a beloved theoretical successor chapter of the bloodline of Korax than that of the Karkaradon's Astra, the Space Sharks. Today, we'll be going over my theories derived from community content on their leader Tyberos, their origins, founding, culture, and more. A fleet-based chapter that raids and trades to get what it needs while donning themselves in oceanic iconography, they can only be called the only loyal space marine pirates. I want to stress again that this video is heavily based in theory crafting, but I will provide reasoning for each part of my view of the chapter as the video progresses. I claim no lore master status, especially where the Karkaradons are concerned. So come aboard with me as we take what we need to defeat the enemies of the Outer Void as we begin. If you'd like to see future videos a week early, along with other unique content, go to the subscribe star link in the description box, select any tier to contribute, and sign up as a member of the Grimdark Army. My thanks to the current men and women in service, whose names are seen here. Grimdark. Half off! There's always room for you, if you want to be my friend. We are, we are on a cruise. We are. The chief defining quality of Tyberos, who is called the Red Wake, is his undeniably abnormal size. So large that even Terminator armor, capable of fitting even the largest of natural space marines, had to be specially fitted for him. There are many theories as to the cause of this dramatic difference in the Shade Lord, even some that claim him to be a missing Primarch. This video posits, however, a much more likely solution to this problem, with evidence taken from a former Warhound Space Marine, Andrad Har. Standing at the same size and ridiculous level of destructive physicality as Tyberos, Endrad was a former Thunder Warrior who went fully through the Astartes implants process, causing his body to grow even larger than a Thunder Warrior who was already larger than a standard Space Marine. The Thunder Warriors were the Emperor's forces on Earth during his conquering of the planet, which would later be known simply as Holy Terra, or Earth in our world. They were effectively shorter-lived, far more brutally violent prototypes of the later spacefaring super soldiers. Har is an important figure because both through his superior effectiveness in battle and his ability to go through a process which usually requires the aspirant to start at the age of 7 or 8 as a full-grown man, he proves that there was always a desire for the Emperor to upgrade the Thunder Warriors into Space Marines after unification. When it became clear after the war that this process would fail in majority, only then did he kill off those who could not be converted. As you may have guessed, I believe that Tyberos was one such figure, and just as Har was placed within the Warhounds, which would later become the World Eaters under Angron, Tyberos was placed in the 19th, which would later become the Raven Guard. This placement also makes sense, as the majority of Terran Astartes would be young boys who would need someone to train them, as well as being the firstborn of the higher-ups of many a conquered tribe. With the majority Zeric bloodline, even after indoctrination, it may have been possible for them to hold grudges over the death of their birth parents in many cases. 
Quelling this by giving them a mentor figure who represents loyalty to the Emperor as a positive thing would be a very smart political move. Another thing that supports this is Tiberos clearly having a more Greek name rather than the often Mongolian-inspired Zeric culture naming scheme we see for Terran Ravenguard like Suko Ono. This would also point to him being from another culture. I would like to end this first section by extending this theory into every original Space Marine Legion, that while very few Thunder Warriors could be converted, they in fact were. We just don't hear about them because they weren't that remarkable. Despite not hearing about it much, there were likely ex-Thunder Warriors in small numbers in every Legion. Not to mention, the Emperor would like to probably keep their existence a secret from the rest of the Astartes, given what they had to do to the rest of the Thunder Warriors. Bang bang. There were likely ex-Thunder Warriors in small number in every Legion during the time before the discovery of their Primarchs and the cultural challenges which would occur after the various name changes. Another aspect supporting this evidence is that while later in the video we will be talking about the idea of the Forgotten One, which is a figure which is theoretically one possible identity is that he's the first founder of the Space Sharks. Uh, but another possible identity is that he could have been Korax, uh, he could have been Kurz. Uh, the most popular theory of this figure is the Terran Raven Guard Arcus Fall. Now, if the Arcus Fall theory is true, it makes even more sense that Tyberos would become the Chapter Master equivalent, the Shade Lord of the Space Sharks, because as we will see in the culture section, age means much to the Karkaradon's Astra. And one thing that I want to clear up now, because the ages of some of these figures in the future make it a bit confusing, the Karkaradons, more than most chapters, are prone to using cryosleep or suspended animation. So this is something that they did often, this is actually one of the basic abilities of a Space Marine that isn't often hit on and often is underutilized in my opinion in a lot of stories, but basically many of them are much older than they would be psychologically because of how long they have slept, and they're known to do this quite a bit, sort of hibernating in a way. Of course, being a Terran Raven Guard, an ex-Thunder Warrior, unlikely to embrace the new Path of Shadows culture the Primarch Corvus Corax would create for the chapter to reform their previous behavior, this would put him squarely in the Deliverers. The Deliverers were known for their use of Terminator power armor as well as a continuation of their terror tactics, psychological warfare, and berserk rage from the special condition of the Sable brand due to their gene seed flaw, much more so than the rest of the chapter, who at this point would be leagues different from them, using the various meditation techniques taught by Corvus. It's also important to remember that the Deliverers were also the carriers of Zarek culture, so we have the first cultural influence, possibly, of the Karkaradons with Zarek culture. They were the last bastions of that when Kiavaran culture was taking over the Raven Guard. This video will use both the second and 23rd foundings as part of our proposed origin of the Karkaradons Astra. But for now, the second founding would make an excellent opportunity to deal with the Deliverers, who Corvus was already trying to honorably discharge without causing more friction in his chapter. For more on that, I do recommend our very long Raven Guard video. Corvus is my favorite Primarch, Raven Guard are my favorite original Legion. One could easily theorize that when the Space Sharks speak of their original ancient founding of being cast into the Void to seek redemption through fighting the enemies of the Outer Void, which means outside the realm of the Imperium, they were referring to the Second Founding, in which Corvus would finally have an excuse to chew them out fully for resembling the tactics of the slavers who he grew up watching people be tortured by, people who he would have considered his adoptive family. Using it as an excuse to both exile them from the Raven Guard and maintain honorable relations with Terra while doing so. A really underrated part of Raven Guard lore that we do go over in that longer video is that the Deliverers didn't technically do anything wrong as far as the Imperium is concerned. They did something wrong in line with Corvus's morality and what he would consider the reputation of the Raven Guard to be. And so a reason to get rid of them is that while they may be loyal citizens of the Imperium, they went against Big Papa Ravenboy. And you don't do that in the Raven Guard. 
As a brief refresher for those unfamiliar with the Sable brand, it is a form of Psyker-influenced Berserker rage specific to the Raven Guard, which causes them to go mad in combat while hearing the voices of the dead. I also call it Lone Wolf Batman Syndrome. Mainstream Raven Guard would have been following Corvus's advice on how to control this flaw by now, but the Deliverers would not, likely embracing the rage, explaining the disregard for casualties in human life found in the later Carcharodons. And also, as we will get into later, it does become something of possibly a religious experience for them. However, I don't believe that Raven Guard were alone in their formation of the original Space Sharks during the second founding. There are simply far too many tactical similarities, motives, and cultural beliefs for the Space Sharks not to be in some way influenced by Nostromen and Night Lord culture. This literally begins with the origins of their symbology, a shark which was hailed as a metaphor for being the most dominant gang on the criminal chapter's homeworld. Night Lords hail from the lineage of the twisted psychic serial killer Primarch Conrad Kurz, whose visions of how those around him would die and ultra-violent upbringing turned him into self-destruction incarnate. Both Conrad and the Night Lords' defining emotion was fear. They were in the most literal sense terrorists, who in many respects could be thought of as a dark reflection of the Raven Guard. They were afraid of themselves, each other, fear was their primary method of attack through psychological warfare which they waged through a dialogue of brutal mutilation and torture of their victims, who they would only attack if they could kill easily or outnumber. Conrad was known for his absolute hatred of Korax, as despite growing up in very similar circumstances and hardships, Corvus had chosen a path of practical yet empathetic heroism, being described as retaining his humanity despite the darkness. One day after years of unstable leadership from possibly the only Primarch to suffer from split personality disorder, Conrad, out of disgust for his own legion who likely reminded him of his own horrid behavior, would destroy their homeworld. I can think of no greater way for the very rebellion and criminally prone Astartes to get their revenge or time for them to have a coming of the Emperor moment or come to the Emperor moment after the destruction of Nostromo, the reformation of that Gotham-like megacity planet into a better home is what made the crusade worth it for many of them. It actually, we'll get to that with Fel Zaros, that was one of his stated motivations than not only declaring their loyalty for the Emperor, but also seeking to serve under Conrad's most hated brother. With the destruction of Nostromo only happening less than a hundred years before the second founding in Space Marine years, they wouldn't have been in the Raven Guard that long before the Deliverers would become the theorized original Space Sharks. I would like to take this time to remind people that the old guard who made up the Deliverers and the Night Lords were near indistinguishable in tactics as well as outlook towards those they conquered, meaning they would be a very good fit for the company in question, especially if Corvus knew he would eventually be able to get rid of them. This would also explain where Space Sharks inherited their raiding in space pirate tactics as the Night Lords before and after the Crusade were known for the same things with the modern Night Lords primarily recruiting in exactly the same way as the Red Tithe which we will go over later in the video. The destruction of Nostromo would not be the only time in which we would see possible Night Lord motivation to join the Loyalists. This would also come after the Council of Nikea, a trial held by the Emperor to decide whether or not Psykers, which are the magic users in the 40k universe, would be allowed to use their abilities as space marines, called librarians in their respective legions. While other legions simply commanded their librarians to return to normal service, forbidding them from using their war powers ever again, the Night Lords, under their first captain Sevatar McEdgelord, would exile their chief librarian Fel Zarost, and when you exile the chief librarian, you have likely without realizing it, as was the standard for the highly disorganized nature of the Night Lords, also exiled the rest as well. So we have a bunch of, well, a lot of homeless Psyker space marines from a gang culture that have a bone to pick with Conrad and his second-in-command, known as Sevatar, who gave the order. Next, also supporting this view is the Space Shark view of darkness as a living thing that differs heavily from the principles of stealth as an absence of light or invisibility held by the Raven Guard. 
but are a one-for-one for, one for the beliefs held by the Night Lords, specifically being described as a living thing with texture and folds. This is the exact way Felzaros, the former lead Night Lord, describes darkness in the book Child of Night. In the short story Child of Night, we not only get this similarity spelled out for us by an in-hiding Felzarost, but also in it ends with a gray-clad space marine specifically said to have sharpened teeth of some kind coming to arrest or recruit him for some trial or judgment. It's a shame that most people think of the Grey Knights when many space marines like the Knights of the Raven or the original Space Sharks also have grey power armor when they hear that line, especially when sharpened teeth lines up directly with the original heraldry, color scheme, and decor uh, decoration of the original Space Sharks. I believe the framing device for Child of Night takes place just before the 23rd founding, and this was a second founding Space Shark coming to get Fell for what would be the reforging of the chapter. This also lines up with Fell being one of the only loyal and heavily idealistic Night Lords we know of. Night Lord influence would also heavily explain the decoration of Space Shark Marines with the skulls of their enemies. If the destruction of Nostromo did indeed cause a coming to the Emperor moment, as I said before, after the Horus Heresy, this would put them on the same track as the Raven Guard as going from an atheistic or anti-theist in the case of the Night Lords, because they were misotheists, I believe it was. They very specifically hate the concept of a god or hate god. In the case of the Night Lords, group into being one that hails the Emperor as a god, which we also see in the Karkaradons, as well as when any of the Raven Guard successor chapters interact with each other in their greetings. A Chimeric Gene Seed would also explain why that same brotherly warm nature is not shared between the Karkaradons and any other Raven Guard successor chapter. The fusion of Nostromen, Zarek, and Thunder Warrior cultures making a good foundation for the slow cultural development of the unique aesthetic found in the later Space Sharks, which resemble Maori culture of our world, or resemble the Maori culture of our world. If we use my theory, they would have had around 6,000 years to make those cultural changes, which is more than enough time. While Corvus would have been merciful enough to allow former Night Lords to serve under him, the second founding would truly be a two birds with one stone situation for him in getting rid of them both. In truth, most of what I wanted to say in this section has already been said in the previous one, so I just want to focus on the original color scheme including alternate color patterns for the chapter in the early years. While the initial gray and black is very much in line with other successor chapters of the Raven Guard, the alternate color scheme of a very loud orange with stripes begging to be called Tiger Shark Armor really speaks to a desire to be seen. I think this speaks to the idea of Nostroman Night Lord, I want you to see me coming fear tactics coming through, as well as gang culture in the early chapter's history. In short, at this time the Gene Seeds or Primarch lineages would have been separate and similar to the red markings to denote certain failures in their old gang culture, I like to think that the ex-Night Lord Space Sharks were tiger shark armor, while the former Deliverer Raven Guard were both the majority of the chapter and the ones clad in gray. And you can also see this because obviously the tiger shark armor was, you know, common enough for it to be called an alternate pattern rather than it being normal pattern. But again, there are people who would say that I'm just citing out of date lore, but I don't know. I'm a crazy person doing a theory video. While I likely have already said this, it also makes sense for this combination of Marines to be the case in the second founding, as right now the entire purpose was just to separate the legions in chapters, so no new Horus could show up and cause trouble with the same level of power. The ratio was likely two Raven Guard to every one Night Lord, as the Tiger Shark armor was common enough to be considered an alternate scheme without being considered the new standard. Again, this is all just theorizing. I know some people might think it's the opposite ratio, but those people aren't remembering how big a problem the Sable brand was for the original Raven Guard, or how the Space Shark Gene Seed now resembles far more of Corvus's flaws than Conrad's. 
For more on that, let's head into our next section. After 6,000 years of culture creation within the chapter, fraternal bonding between brothers and devotion to their specific religion to the Emperor as the Void Father, it is my belief that the chapter would be called in to be reformed under the 23rd Sentinel Founding. To understand the Sentinel Founding, you must first understand the Cursed One which came before it. While the Cursed 21st Founding was something like the first attempt to correct gene seed flaws by the High Lords of Terra resulting in many abominations and traitors, the Sentinel Founding was a much more clear attempt at increasing group cohesion within the ranks of the Astartes. Given the lack of connection on a genetic level between the existing space sharks at this time, taking the existing Night Lord and Raven Guard gene seeds, then splicing them together, followed by a replacement of their current heritage, would both make sense and make them all true blood brothers. Gene seed replacement is far from unheard of, as it is also core to the origins of the Grey Knights, and Chimeric Gene Seed frequently shows up as a possibility in the Space Sharks and is confirmed as being a part of the Minotaur's chapter heritage. This is, of course, also supported by the Sentinel Founding merely being the High Lords of Terra trying to get the Cursed Founding right, where mutation, contamination, and hybridizing of Gene Seed was very common. From here, they would likely no longer have any need for the Tiger Shark color scheme, as the family would finally be of one heritage. The new and improved Carcharodons, a chapter 6,000 years in the making. By M41, 4,000 years later, they are stated to be 10,000 years old, putting my theory once again directly in line with the lore. While the modern chapter does have a home world to recruit from since the Badab War, which we'll get into later, this has not affected their still Night Lord-esque recruitment strategies and pirate-like headquarters. A battle barge is a truly amazing vessel. Resembling a great gothic city fused with a space station in design, we can only assume the Nikor to be 3.3 times larger than an average vessel of this type. This is because it must be capable of carrying an entire chapter of 1,000 marines or more, given both the standard capabilities of a battle barge only being able to house around 300 marines, and the likelihood of deviation from the Codex Astartes being very high from exploring the edge of space for so long. This is despite the fact that the Space Sharks are a loyalist and very, to some degree, imperial edict and law-abiding chapter. Think of that more like, and it would be more accurate to say, gentlemen pirates, because there's just no way that you're away from a civilization for that long without deviating from that core rule book to some degree. It's not out of disloyalty or because they're dissuading themselves of, oh, that stupid old book written by uh, Rabute Gilliman, we don't want anything to do with that. Instead, it very much is we must do this to survive. Given their harsh rating, which makes use of whatever vessels they come across, I imagine the Nikor as this great unique battle barge fused together with metal from other ships. Additional studies have shown that this battle barge is a heavily converted Vengeance-class cruiser, which would support the idea of it being both bigger and faster than other ships of the same purpose. It also simply gives the theoretical front of the ship a more seafaring look, which is great for the aesthetics of this chapter. Nikor is an old English word meaning water demon, and the rest of the fleet follows a similar naming structure as the space equivalent of the Black Pearl from Pirates of the Caribbean. The Nikor houses Tyberos the Red Wake himself, along with his Red Brethren. These are all Terminator armored veterans, very much in line with the unique Deliverers Company of the old Raven Guard. The twin normal-sized battle barges of Annihilation and Skyla are the home of those same Red Brethren, who we can assume to be 600 marines in number, as they literally require two battle barges. The third company, which is also in charge of conducting the recruiting ritual of the Red Tithe and the technology acquisition ritual of the Grey Tithe, controls at least three vessels, the White Maw, Grey Harvest, and Void Revenant. This three-ship team is designed for quick travel to an area, looting a planet dry, and immediately rejoining the rest of the fleet using whatever force was deemed necessary. A lot of force is usually deemed necessary. This is also where the ships start to become more unique, very clearly being commandeered human vessels of different varieties. The White Maw was seemingly originally used by Remembrancers, which were the chroniclers during the Great Crusade. The Grey Harvest was originally, and to some degree still is, a storage vessel called a frigate, and the Void Revenant was seemingly originally for commercial or luxury use like a space yacht. 
The fifth company controls the twin gunships referred to respectively as the Matahi and the Silent Judge. The final two vessels are another co-opted higher class frigate called the Adamantius, where tech such as vehicles are stored, and the Skylior, which is used as a place of secret record keeping. It's the same model as the Grey Harvest. I've listed all the actual models in our infographic on screen within the lore if you'd like to see them. The reason I'm communicating these ideas this way regarding the ships is that most of my audience is very unfamiliar with 40k, but in addition to that, when it comes to a pirate-themed Space Marine chapter, which I will hold to that being the weird place that the Carcharodons hold, loyalists but also obviously space pirates, it just helps to contextualize them like pirates in real history by understanding their chapter culture, but that chapter culture comes from the basically religion of the ruling caste or group or ruling crew or captain, and then in addition to that, the ships themselves, which are always this very iconic thing with the Jolly Roger that in pirate history is course what makes them very famous. Speaking of that, let's move on to their view of faith, referred to as being servants of Rangu, the Void Father. This religion really only makes sense as a cultural development when one understands that they have the belief of the Emperor as a god of all, and their original leader, referred to as the Forgotten One, as a saint or minor god of redemption that modern Raven Guard, along with most of their successor chapters have of Korax, mixed with the Night Lord Librarian view of darkness as a living, breathing thing. As a result, if we were making a religious comparison, the Void Father, aka the God Emperor of Mankind, is much like the Father aspect and and the Forgotten One is much like the Sun aspect of the Christian Trinity, even being referred to as being sired by the God Emperor himself. While the Void is like the Holy Spirit living active will of God that acts through believers. This idea of the Void as the living will of the Emperor would again be backed up by the idea of the term Void being interchangeable with space in 40k, along with the Outer Void very specifically being designated as enemy territory, making the rest of the Milky Way under the Emperor's territory something like his living will. When one mixes this with the way their librarians will literally manifest giant shark jaws to gore their enemies, and use darkness to influence the minds of their enemies to drown them in fear, fear is a blade that sharpens the more you use it, that's the old Night Lord's Conrad Kerr's quote, you get what really is the heritage of both the original pre-Korax 19th and the Nostroman Night Lords. This theory once again fits very well with their view of redemption, being sent forth to overcome the original sin of being descendant from traitors and sadistic killers on both sides. This is their call to action. This is why they must, as the Angelica Mortis says, set about the traitor, the alien, and the renegade without mercy. Given that they also view themselves internally as being in exile, we can also see what the chapter's end goal is from a rapture-like perspective. That once all the enemies of mankind have been slaughtered in brutal fashion, they will be fully redeemed being welcomed back to Holy Terra itself as heroes of the Imperium and true sons of the Emperor. It's a very good cultural motivation for what would otherwise be an unnecessarily risky lifestyle even for space marines. They may also see the berserk rages they go into which causes them to disregard human life or casualties during their activities as a religious experience which gives them a certain kind of cultural euphoria or excuse to engage in the sadism both sides of their heritage were known for. To the Karkaradons, the traitor, alien, and heretic are viewed as an opportunity for holy communion with the living void through a feeding frenzy of gory bloodshed. This religious view of violence can also be used to explain why they are often capable of extreme polite formality when dealing with the Adeptus Mechanicus of Mars, various officials of the Imperium, and even the passive-aggressive relationship they share with the Ashen Claws Raven Guard successor chapter. This relationship being another point in both the hybrid gene seed and partial Nightlord heritage theory, sort of grouping, 
as when Raven Guard successor chapters usually interact with each other, there is an intimate respect and clear brotherhood or brotherly love expressed through different traditions. But as a result of their Night Lord genes, there is a lasting natural antagonism with those pure sons of Korax. Another clear example of their Raven Guard heritage is shown to us in their gene seed flaw, Chill of the Void, which is a behavioral one for one of their parent chapter's curse, the Sable Brand. With the Marines slowly going mad from Lone Wolf Syndrome until they eventually die in a strategic misstep of madness, taking on one too many enemies at once. The only difference seems to be in how they deal with this tendency. Instead of the trifold path of shadow, they have their own outer void crusade. They feed that inner serial killer beast so it doesn't get out of hand. A very Conrad answer to a very Corvus problem. This once again points to making the blood frenzies they engage in during battle even more important to the chapter as they are literally the therapy for them to maintain their sanity in addition to being a kind of religious experience or intense active meditation. Moving deeper into their religion, we once again get a very serious sort of similar view to the Raven Guard, as much like them, instead of being derivative of the Imperial cult, they believe effectively the lore-accurate version of the Horus Heresy when it comes to the Emperor and their Primarch's divinity, that they were mortal beings who ascended to godhood through their own power. Their divinity is undeniable, but so too is the fact that they walked in the flesh among them. It stated explicitly that after the second founding, they were purposely sent on a suicide mission into the farthest reaches of the galaxy. This is, of course, another sign pointing to the Forgotten One being, well, not necessarily Arcus Fall or any specific Primarch, but really just kind of an unknown figure, I would say. Originally, I was actually going to say Korax, believe it or not, but I would continuously go back to that theory and realize probably not. It was most likely an unknown figure of Space Marines. It could be Arcus Fall, because we don't have a lot of information on Arcus Fall, so he fits as the name, possibly, of the Forgotten One. And the original Space Sharks being the mix match group of the Deliverers, allowing the Raven Lord to get rid of two mass-enslaving birds with one exile-shaped stone. The Karkaradons also believe in a strict meritocratic caste system. This is shown by what gear different members are allowed to wear. Chapter Serfs are a permanent untouchable class, with their entire society, numbering in the thousands, not being allowed to touch the war gear, weapons, or armor of their betters. Above them are the newly trained Scout Marines, who have not yet undergone their ten years of trial that allow them to leave that position by culturally receiving their oceanic tattoo-like markings with every rank above that being the result of time and experience effectively being a form of rule by elders. If any lower-ranked brother touches the war gear of a higher-ranked one, they have committed the crime of tapu, which translates, in its original meaning, to the definition of desanctification. This makes sense when we examine their view of purification through redemption. Older Astartes have been serving longer, thus have engaged in more blood rages. As a result, they are more pure, or more redeemed. Remember we talked about the blood rages and the frenzies being a religious experience or a form of communion, literally drinking of the blood in some cases, not to steal too much of the blood angel's glory. To touch their war gear is to make yourself less pure and to insult your older brothers who you should be learning from. This same line of logical thinking would make the chapter serfs irredeemable in the chapter's eyes. In addition to this, the restriction from touching war gear or power armor shows us that the serfs of the chapter are essentially deckhands likely being used to operate and maintain the various chapter fleets. They work at the eternal car wash of the void, navigating the stars to bring their lords to their next mission. This is shown by the Shipmaster of the White Maw, a chapter surf known as Tico. They are best thought of as all the non-combat roles on a sailing vessel, navigators, cooks, shipwrights, and more. 
All in all, being an eternal space pirate is a better fate than being a servitor or actual slave in the demeaning sense, so it's a better fate than most in the position in other chapters. In a weird way, the refusal to allow serfs to participate in the cleaning of war gear or armor is them rejecting the cruelty of the past while also still demanding loyalty from those they rule over. It also may be possible that the serfs aren't a part of the caste system and are viewed the same way that ultramarines view the citizens of their 500 worlds. That is to say, an actual understanding that while they must serve in different ways, they are not better than normal humans. This would also help explain their loyalist morality, you know, the fact that they literally are just respecting the people that they're giving these imperial edicts to, that they're reasoning with, they want permission to go fight in the Badab War, things like that. The only reason I throw this in as a possibility is that the reason the Deliverers were cast out is their inability to conform to the new culture of their anti-slavery Primarch. In the same way that the Raven Guard are prone to their heraldry's namesake of the Corvus Power Armor, the modern Carcharodons most commonly utilize the Mark V Heresy Armor, easily the most grill-focused of helms with bulbs across the shoulder and leg plates resembling barnacles. This aesthetic is perfect for the chapter, also speaking to their older nature. It's the best possible armor for any monster-themed chapter. Rare armors used by the chapter include some Mark II Crusade armor, which has a similar aesthetic effect in a more noble way, looking more knightly, and some older members who may still use Corvus armor in the modern age as I go back and forth on whether or not they got rid of the lighter gray as well as the tiger shark patterns of armor from their second founding. I like to think the most eccentric members of the chapter would still use the orange stripes because they want to be seen before battle to attract enemies to them. Conversely, this could also be a design favored by the Red Brethren for their Terminator armor. They are the veteran company of the chapter, thus the highest in purity just below the Shade Lord himself. In addition to that, there must be some kind of beauty to it. Just the fact that I... Okay, look, they're called Red Brethren. I, I want... I want them to wear the orange stripes because they're called Red Brethren. Does that make does that make sense? I want I want it. The most important roles in their management of resources are the Reaper Prime and the Harvester Prime. These are the two leaders of the third company in their respective gray and red tithes. Tithes are a term dating back to the original legions of space marines, usually being in reference to young boys given up to become recruits from different worlds, along with gene seed, which is the essence of a primarch that exists within a space marine's body, influencing their thought process, which are sent back to Holy Terra by most space marine chapters, as a kind of tribute. The Space Sharks use Red Tithe to refer to the acquisition of human life through raids, which will be conducted if their demands are not met. Another Night Lord connection comes to us from the term Red Tithe, which was originally used to refer to the prison children being used to form the most infamous generation of that legion, which was the most direct motivation for Conrad's desire to blow up their home planet. A Carcharodon's red tithe under the Reaper Prime is described as a harvest, implying that brutal force is used. With the red in this context, obviously referring to living humans, often while inflicting extreme injury on them or possibly also the much more harsh rites that younglings must undergo before rising through the rank of Scout. Many people contacted me with great interest about the Red Tithe after I announced I was doing this video, but I'm sorry to say, it's very surface level. The Karkaradons are loyalists, so they do go through the entire legalese process of getting an Imperial Edict to do so, but they are there for a quick brute force taking of the population, followed by an immediate speedy trip back to join the rest of the fleet, to train the new recruits. The Grey Tithe really hits home the fact that for 10,000 years, despite this group being extremely loyalist, those years really were spent on the edge of the Imperium. As far as the authorities of the Mechanicum of Mars are concerned, that essentially makes them unofficial renegades. In the Imperium of Man, the creation of new technology is a form of heresy, going against edicts to prevent a new uprising of artificial intelligence from becoming a threat to humanity as it was in 
in millennia past. All pieces of technology are also believed and now confirmed through the Minor Chaos demigod Vashtor in the lore to have a literal machine spirit. These spirits are sanctified and blessed by the Mechanicum of Mars to keep them working, which may or may not help. With how sacred and dangerous technology is, you can understand why Mars wouldn't just trust anyone with it. Thankfully, the Space Shark's Grey Tithe's first phase is the raiding of Archaeotech, which is just a fancy word for old human technology from an age when humanity was in a Star Trek-like utopian fa phase before the AI uprising. By trading the technology to the Adeptus Mechanicus, they can get what they need, like any other chapter for vehicles, war gear, and more. This of course makes the concept of purity held by many of the chapter towards the older chapter members' war gear make more sense as well. They will also make trades with the renegades, known as the Ashen Claws we mentioned previously. The relationship is great for the characterization of both chapters, as the Karkaradons are harsh loyalists who many consider to be renegades because of their behavior, and the Ashen Claws are renegades who many would consider naturally to be loyalists because of their behavior. They both operate near their own respective edge of their own allegiances without realizing it. Their most prominent members often antagonize each other, which allows for a great rivalry despite having a shared purpose. If you want to perform your own Red Tithe, you'll probably need today's sponsor, Ronin Craft. Ronin Craft is an independent 3D model printing service with an excellent customer review score on Etsy. He's been instrumental in the creation of my own Raven Guard successor chapter, the Celestial Eagles. With Ronin Craft, you can be sure you'll get quality that surpasses any master for all your weird fiction and fantasy needs. Sponsor link below. Highly recommended for any tabletop group. The defeat of the Mantis Warriors chapter during the Badab War is considered by many to be one of the defining conflicts of the chapter, along with their interactions with the Night Lord's Chaos Legion, who, if our theory holds, are one of their natural enemies. There is also an interaction with the Dark Eldar, Space BDSM Dark Elves, showing their talent for logic-based psychological manipulation in interrogations. The Badab War was like a giant car pileup that keeps getting bigger until it just stops. You may have heard jokes about the Astral Claws not paying their taxes, but the reality was that effectively their chapter master wanted to set up his own smaller version of the 500 worlds of Ultramar in the Badab system under his control, viewing it as his responsibility to rule so that corruption could never again form on the main planet the Astral Claws were occupying, which they were only sent to to quell a rebellion. So already we have a chain reaction of events. The Astral Claws are in reality very reactionary loyalists of the Imperium that are taking over this territory because, why? because they want to stop rebellion, and in doing so, they rebel. The slow car pileup aspect comes from the fact that several other Space Marine chapters, as well as the members of every other possible subfaction of the Imperium of Man, were also sent with them. One of these Space Marine chapters were the underrated, merciless, and in this instance, very unlucky Mantis Warriors. They, of course, were one of many secessionists on the side of the Astral Claws. The Karkaradons and the Mantis Warriors could not be more different in their tactics. While the Mantis Warriors suffered from a flaw called the Battle Haze, which allowed them to hyper-focus on their enemy, giving them warrior tunnel vision, the Space Sharks were interested in nothing more than pure carnage, going into one of their chapter-defining blood frenzies. I say the Mantis Warriors were ruthless because they tried to use civilians as human shields to stop the Space Sharks from progressing. Needless to say, it didn't stop them in the slightest, and the Mantis Warriors became only one of many casualties in the Sharknado. After the Badab War, the homeworld of the former Loyalists was given to the Space Sharks to harvest recruits from during the Red Tithe. As I said before, this doesn't stop them from recruiting from literally everywhere. The only difference is now, if the nomadic fleet is in the area and running low on supplies, you will now get a large number of Chinese space pirates in that generation. The homeworld is called Oethica, get it? Because it's the, it's the eggs that Mantises lay, get it? It's Oethica, because Mantis Warriors. 
but it's almost not worth mentioning because of how inconsequential it is. One of the most endearing and almost cosmic horror elements of the chapter is that they operate at the near edge of the Imperium's territory, essentially circling it, waiting for someone to think they're tough enough to attack, or until they themselves feel hungry. Almost like a shark. No enemy is more indicative of this position than their interactions with the Dark Eldar who by their nature are only fought on the edge of human territory. Having a culture surrounding extreme sensation, thus primal torture methods, the agent of this race caught by the Carcharodons would receive a very special treatment. Instead of any physical torture method which the space elf would likely be resistant to, they simply left the degenerate maniac alone in a room with his own thoughts, solitary confinement forcing one to face their own inner demons, something no Drukhari could stand. In addition to this, he would be fed one meal a day and doused with ice water, a very minimal but highly effective punishment that would slowly break his mind into a state of learned helplessness as, if humans were social animals, the torture-driven Eldar were social addicts. Eventually, he would give them the information they needed, not due to pain, but in truth, gaslighting and loneliness. Gaslighting isn't real, you're just crazy. This, along with their desire to be legally up-to-date in their actions when in the Inner Imperium on rare occasion, really does paint the picture of Night Lords who finally grew up and learned self-discipline. Speaking once again of the Night Lords, the Karkaradon's novel series gives us a long altercation with them on the prison world of Zartak in the book series' second installment, Red Tithe. This story heavily features the head librarian of the chapter as the main heroic figure in a near evenly matched contest of gore with various warped elements of the glorified 1980s slasher villains. While the average Night Lord and Space Shark are fairly evenly matched, this librarian puts them all to shame, proving to be the defining advantage that wins them the altercation. It highlights the lack of any Psyker forces on the side of the Night Lords, and the weakness which the Sharks are able to exploit by manipulating the Sons of Kerr's obsessive desire for ambushing any of those they deem defenseless. All of these interactions show a strength that sets them apart from any similar legion. That is the power of compartmentalization. They view themselves as human bombs, being saved for just the right moment. This is just speaking tactically. Their villains, whether Night Lords or Drukhari, effectively have a partial pirate-like feel to them as well, but are driven by a more primal instinct. Their sensory addiction being compared to the logical dominance of the otherwise wild men of the Void shows how these loyalists are perfectly adapted to the fringe of the Imperium. In each case, by turning their own sadism on and off like a light switch through their religious instinct, they gain the advantage over those who truly do lack an off switch. Tyranids, Drukhari, Night Lords, and more. I know we didn't cover Tyranids in this video, they're, they're big murder bugs that are based off of the Xenomorphs from Alien. Finally, we come to the most famous named members of the Space Sharks who we have touched on previously. Company Master Bail Shar, Chief Librarian Te Kaurangi, and just as we started the video with where we believe the Red Wake originated, we will end the video with what Tyberos is like in the modern millennia. Bail Shar is a great example of rare power armor models being used mixed with what the Space Sharks look for in recruits. He was originally Cedric, the young boy recruited at the end of the Red Tithe novel, which our opening quote comes from. He's the current Reaper Prime in charge of recruitment, utilizing the stock standard disciplined berserker tactics of the Legion. His interesting elements tie into an opening statement we made about Tyberos, that he was once a Thunder Warrior. In the case of Bail Shar, his Crusader pattern power armor seems at least in part converted from Mark I Thunder Warrior's armor. This character is also the source of why some people theorize the Space Sharks to be world eaters as the Ashen Claw leader, called Bail Shar, a brother of the sons of the tormented murderer gorilla Angron. To me, these claims can be dismissed based on the fact that the entirety of the Ashen Claw's relationship with the Space Sharks is based in antagonism, likely from a never being able to be admitted jealousy of the other's lifestyle. Karkaradons are jealous of the true freedom of the actual renegades, and the Ashen Claws are jealous of the closer ties to the Imperium that the unlikely loyalists possess. It's a classic, this is my rival and I hate him, but if anyone else attacks them, I will slaughter their entire family relationship. Their entire dialogue essentially is trading goods while insulting each other's mothers. 
Bail Shar was clearly being insulted during this time, and it was not meant literally, being the equal of an ethnic insult calling them half-breeds, as that would be more in line with our theory, and what the Ashen Claws believe about the space sharks. Te Kahurangi's Psyker Might was on display in the same novel as Bail Shar's recruitment. I believe he is at least a former Night Lord librarian of some kind. Te is also called the Pale Nomad, he's said to be the oldest living member, or if our theory holds about Tiberos, the second oldest living member of the Karkaradons. In addition to being a powerful psyker master of gore, he also tells stories to younger members about the chapter's history, said to be part of the third generation recruited by the chapter. The mythos he weaves of the chapter is one of the mythical first generation, sent even further beyond the outer void to do battle for eternity out of love for the Emperor, along with the Forgotten One. It is this version of events that points to the idea of Arcus Fall once again being the Forgotten One, known as a gentleman to Imperial officials and a paradoxically heavy stealth predator in battle. Tiberos is the most interesting Astartes in the world. He has gained many names over the centuries, the most famous of which are Reaper Lord of the Void and the Red Wake. His fighting style is that of the Red Brethren, otherwise known as the Second Company of the Karkaradon's Astra. Clad in Terminator armor, these veterans of the chapter are the closest to redemption and purity in line with their chapter's religion. As with the Raven Guard Deliverers, they are outfitted in Terminator armor, but unlike that company, the Red Brethren are easily the cultural trendsetters of their chapter. Much like Tay was almost single-handedly responsible for the defeat of the Night Lords on the prison planet of Zartak, Tyberos was responsible for the defeat of the Mantis Warriors during the Badab War. The Shade Lord's company likely has a similar semi-tapped into psyker ability for void-like stealth or psychic invisibility similar to the Shadow Walkers of the Raven Guard, which would fully explain their ability to disappear in heavy Terminator armor, while also being likely, due to their age and constant training through real battle, which would make them more likely to unlock this skill than younger members. The second company truly embodies their heraldry as Apex heavily armored close combat predators that disappear before attacking in brutal feeding frenzies of gore. The largest of these monsters in the form of Astartes is the Megalodon among men, Tyberos himself, being depicted as twice the normal size of a space marine. By estimate, that would make him around 16 feet or 4.8 meters. His signature weapons are a pair of unique gauntlets with lightning claws referred to as Hunger and Slake. Attached to both of them are a palm and forearm covered in moving chain blades, making the gore that erupts from his attacks even more ultra-violent. Big T is also the master of the compartmentalization that sets the chapter apart from gore mongers like the Night Lords, only willing to face those who have a fighting chance, much like the original Yaucha from the first Predator movie. Though, don't tell them that, I don't want to be killed for heresy. The most iconic image of him coming to us from fan art, depicting him turning off one of his lightning claws to even the playing field with a mantis warrior who has already had one of his arms ripped off, likely earlier in that same battle. This silent but deadly gentle giant sits atop the masters of controlled chaos that are the Karkaradon's Astra. As we draw this video to a close, I just want to thank everyone who donated and positively commented on my Raven Guard video. Even though the views don't measure up to my Conan stuff, the comments have been well thought out and incredibly heartfelt. My thanks to my still anonymous $50 a month donator who signed up to my subscribe star, that was incredibly kind. Whoever you are, you are my hero for two months in a row now. Once again, I'd like to thank my wonderful sponsor Ronan Craft, who has made many of my videos possible and is one of the many reasons I can afford to do more than one video a year. Thank you to all of my donators on Subscribestar who want me to be able to eat. A special thank you to the other members of the Warhammer 40k YouTube community who have been very supportive of my work. Arthur Bones, Chrono the Harley Quinn, The Gaming Storyteller, Tom from Astartes Anonymous, A Border Prince, Warhammer Wiki, and the folks at the Lore Crimes podcast. A special thank you to Chaotic Voices for helping me with the vocals of our little One Piece joke during the opening. If you're not subbed to them or me by now, I deeply recommend you do so. Last but not least, thank you all for watching, and have a lovely night.